let's put our virtual hands together for the stars of tonight, uh, Andrew and Gabe. Hey guys, how's it going? What's up? Hey how you doing? How did you guys end up as a writing team? So this goes back to uh, NYU. We met uh, freshman year and we were friends basically right away. And we discovered a lot of filmmakers together, watched a lot of our favorite movies together for the first time. We lived together again after college and I was reading scripts for a little indie uh, company in New York and Gabe was working for an artist. Right, and I think there was, there really was sort of a barrier to entry at that point, because I think probably for everybody, it's like, how do you go from haven't written anything to being a working screenwriter? And it feels like there's just this big hump, right? Yeah. So we just like took that on really fast. It's funny because when we first started, it was the two of us sitting side by side at a desk at the same computer, just coming up with scenes like on the fly. When we first started writing the screenplay to when we actually sold it, I think there was probably like a, about like a two year process there where we went from being absolute goofballs who had no clue what we were doing to people who had started to almost kind of study the craft on the fly. So it was like, at, at, at first it was us sitting side by side at a computer late into the night, you know, uh, just coming up with, with completely absurd ideas. We're like, hey, wouldn't it be interesting if suddenly our characters could uh, teletransport to the top of a, a, a mountain and go skiing? And we were like, that's awesome. Let's do it. And, and I think that's something that we had going for us is that we were humble enough at that point to know that what we were doing wasn't good. Mm -hmm. And so our first, our first like five drafts never saw the light of day with the exception of like, five or six of our closest friends that we would we would write their name on the cover page and, and hand them out in hard copy and get notes back from them and slowly but surely it went from this like unreadable load of garbage to something that actually started to kind of take on an interesting shape well, it also um, kind of pointed out i think two different things for us which is the writing and the storytelling mm. and that's something that we started to learn over time and we realized early on that even though the storytelling was kind of garbage, the 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 writing showed like promise. People yeah. liked the way that we were writing things. Mm -hmm. They liked our naivete, if I guess if you want to call it that, or like we were having fun with it. I mean, I think the, the read of the script is, is incredibly important. Not as important as the story, but uh, the read is is just at least for us and for people like making a career like us, uh, the read is what gets people kind of coming back to us. Cause you start to parse out like, you know, what are your real strengths here? And I think early on, it felt like our strengths were an ability to write, an ab ability to write a certain way. And over the years, we developed this very nuanced ability to tell stories. But that that little kernel of being able to just write and have fun with it is is kind of the football that we just like ran with. <laughs> Are you finding that one of you is better at one aspect and the other is better at other aspects, or are you both kind of bringing the same strengths to the table? I think we've we've like been learning that about ourselves over the entire experience of working together. Mm -hmm. I, I think it there's there were certain things that were kind of obvious about like one strengths versus the other strengths, just in terms of like thinking, like Andrew thinks differently than I think. And it's nice because he has he 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 sort of like covers bases that I don't cover. Right. So we do have like kind of a like a whole brain approach. But like uh, it we've we've been wondering that the whole time and yes. it seems to like kind of keep crystallizing and we kind of seem to keep kind of filling in the gaps and and it, and it oftentimes i think will evolve from project to project depending on what we're covering i mean early on in our career the the joke was because i i studied philosophy and he studied art so if you take if you take philosophy and art and combine them you get something kind of like cinema and it's and and like i think that like if you were to sort of be really re like reductive about it uh 
Gabe is very visual and very artistic and I'm very analytical and word based. And so, uh, you know, when it comes to um, crafting a scene, you know, I'll, I'll approach it very analytically and then Gabe will sort of take a step back and sort of be like, well, okay, well, but what's the underlying thing here? Or how can we make it special by doing something you wouldn't expect here or here? But again, like from project to project, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll yeah, find- totally flip. Yeah. In, in unexpected ways. And you know, we always liken it to kind of being in a band. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like being in a marriage too. Yeah. We're very good at that. We get into like really fun fights with each other mm -hmm. and then like apologize, <laughs> like really sweet. How do you agree on a vision for what the project is at the beginning? How do you both get aligned on that? And then how do you kind of together stay on that course? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. We have our kind of situation where before we start getting into something, we usually have fully aligned on our vision. That might mean we talked for 72 hours. Is there a formal process? Do you guys go to a bar? Are you Zooming? Are you uh, like, what? how are you, how are you doing this? We're usually in different towns and sometimes states. Uh, so we're talking every day a lot. Mm. And, uh, and then when it comes to the aesthetics of the script, we're working that out together. Like sometimes we're just working through the script at the same time. And we'll be like, should we format this like this? I don't know. Like that looks kind of weird. Like, and then it's like, all right, no, that is better. So let's go back and like find all the other examples and like replace it all the way up. That one's better. Like we're, we're gonna we're gonna go with that. If one of you thinks that the other thing the other person loves just is not working, you know, like uh, how do you kill kill their darling? You know, as this as the phrase goes, so just, just accident, hack it off, and act like it never happened. And I like, I like it never existed, I think is how we generally go about it. In the first stage of the writing, um, I think that we we almost approach every scene knowing that it's going to change a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so so if there's something there are like, there, you know, if there's something that we feel is really important in, in the in the first stage of the writing, it's almost like we've probably already figured that out together. Mm -hmm. um, but there are moments where, you know, like, um, uh, we're, we're in such constant contact that like uh, it's not it's not uncommon that you know i'll get a call from gabe i, I know i know he's editing i handed him I, I handed off some pages to him and he's editing them and he'll call me and he'll be like um so i think we have to talk about this scene and then we'll just sit and talk about it and sometimes it's for f five minutes and sometimes it's for five hours and we'll you know it's like w if if but i think what i think what works is with us is that best idea always does tend to win. If a line I love or a scene that I love is changing in a, dra in a dramatic way, I'll like fight for it up until the point where I'm like, ah, shit, you're right. And then we, we get there. It seems like you have to love the project more than you love your contribution to it. Right? Right. Because then you're like, oh, I don't want the project to suffer by having the thing that I love. I think something that we've learned over the years is just making sure that we're not uh, entering into our projects half cocked hmm. like we spend as much time as we have to spend um going in to feel as though we both kind of already watched the movie in our head yeah right like beginning to end tonally maybe the jokes aren't written but the moments of humor exist the the dramatic moments exist like we kind of get it beginning to end and, and know where it's going. And then, and then everything is sort of like, well, does that really serve that? The way Hollywood works is that someone passes a script on to someone else and you have someone who, you know, will go to bat for you, who, who cares about you enough to pass on that script. They're kind of putting themselves on the line a little bit saying like, hey, I vouch for this script. I like this script. So, you know, it has to be good. Well, I think that, that it goes back to what I was saying before in the sense that like, we all read a lot of scripts and it, what I've learned is that it's uh, the ones that really kind of float to the top aren't necessarily because your story concept is like the best 
story concept ever that like just needs you know so much stuff comes out right so it's like you're you're never reading something and being like oh this is just like the most incredible story it's always the writing and so you read something from somebody who is new and it sticks with you you're like wow like this person's actually like really good at this right like they have like a real ease and they write well they write screenplay as well right. so first off what is a script doctor and second then how did you get that job so we we had met um peyton reed who directed the, uh, the ant-man movies um in a general meeting as just kind of part of the phase of our career where we were out competing for gigs doing open writing assignments meeting people tons of general meetings is what they call them um and we we had a really great meeting with peyton where we were, we were just talking about ant-man wasn't even on the radar for any of us at that point uh so we just talked about things we were interested in and sort of had like a rapport um and then when the news dropped um maybe six months to a year later um that uh edgar wright was leaving the project and that peyton had come on to to take over and that and that Marvel was looking for someone to come on to to work on the script to basically live on set and 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 handle the day to day. Our manager sort of immediately called and got us a conversation that um that we Peyton knew who we were and remembered us and so he was like, "Yeah, let's hear from them." And so we had a really good meeting with Brad Winderbaum, the executive who had read our open writing assignment uh script, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. So sort of a full circle moment where like a lot of these scripts that weren't taking us anywhere, suddenly this writing sample got us hired by Marvel because they liked that script so much. But the, but in this process, just to say, just to kind of make it clear to everyone who, who may be like, wait, what? Like filming and everything, this is, the script's already been written, right? Like perhaps many writers have already worked on this script. I don't know how many there were along the way in the development process of, of the first Ant-Man movie. Yeah. Right. But so your job isn't to come up like with the script as most of us think. And like we've talked about coming up with scripts and writing them. You're there for to be on set for things that come up kind of and like need to need changes to be made or it's not working. So we need to try something else or what's so the script had already been written. It was it, the original script was was Joe Cornish and Neger Wright. And then by the time we got down there, uh, Paul Rudd and Adam McKay had done a draft. But when we went down there, even though we were down there to sort of just be the writers who plugged things in when necessary, when we were on set, because it was all going to be this amorphous thing that was changing every day. Um, they also wanted to hear our thoughts. And we had this sort of right for Peyton, right? Like, so you, as you could imagine, um, an Edgar Wright script is very Edgar Wright. So there was this process of sort of like uh, stripping away kind of some of the person, like the, the Edgar Wrightisms out of it and turning it into a new thing that, that wasn't quite so auteur driven. And so it was a little bit about like linking up with Peyton and saying like, well, what do we, what do you want out of this? So like, you know, we, we, uh, we played ball with them and, and we're good at it and we didn't, cause any problems we just did our job and 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 kind of got it done and so when it came time to say like all right there's going to be an ant-man 2 everybody in the process was like we should give these guys the chance all right so yeah. once you guys get alignment on the story um i think i read in another interview super long outlining process right like to get that outline kind of set before you went to script was that accurate or what was that like months and months yeah months and months. like be because because so once once you start to get to a place where the um in in these round table sessions the story starts to find its form then gabe and i go down the hallway and sit in a in a in a smaller office and we write outlines that are the entire movie i mean basically scriptments that were like 30 40 50 pages long and then we would hand them in and we would get notes on them and I think we probably did, you know, 10 different iterations of that for, for various versions of the film. Like we, we, we would go down the road on an iteration of the film and then there'd come a moment where we were like, well, this isn't working. So let's let's abandon ship and try again. And, and, and so once the outline sort of seems right to the executives and the creatives, 
then it goes up the chain. And I mean, you know, every, everyone has has a, a look at it and only then do you go to script. Yeah, okay. because obviously it has to, um, not only does it have, have to um, pass through a guy like Kevin Feige, but the Russos down the, down the road here also are going to need to weigh in because they're like, well, here's what we're planning on doing with, with Ant-Man. Right. So it's, yeah. it's like, that'll work here. This will work. Okay. That'll work. And, and so it all kind of comes together. There, there's been, there's been a handful of moments in our career where the, the professional screenwriter sort of collided headlong with just the, the movie fan, um, work meeting and working with Paul was one of those. Um, but when we were working on Ant-Man 2 and we needed to gut check a plot element um, in terms of how it worked with, with Endgame, mm -hmm. they, they, we, they took us down the hall to where Marcus and McFeely and Joe and Anthony were working on, 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 on uh, boarding those two movies. And, they, and it was a conference room with every single scene from the beginning of Infinity to the end of Endgame carted out in order. And and they basically gave us a tour of those two movies. We were like, we know how it ends. Yeah, and we were like, take your cell phones away before you like went into that room, so you couldn't like. They probably it. should have. But <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> do you follow the hero's journey in your films, and if so, how important do you consider it? We don't tend to follow like rigid structures when you like break it down into like a bajillion beats, but I do think that it's hugely important to think about your inciting incidents and what page your act break is, your first act break is gonna be on because mm -hmm. people do not want to read a story where you nothing's happened until page 35, right? Yeah. That, that's and, incredibly important because I, I think that maybe the most important thing that we've learned is like, don't, don't sort of like approach the hero's journey in the sense that like your plot needs to sort of fall into those categories because because that's too prescriptive but from a rhythm standpoint uh if your screenplay hasn't done something interesting by page 10 or 15 with an inciting incident the reader's going to get bored if you haven't transitioned from setup to to, to 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 the meat of your tail uh somewhere around page 25 or 30 the reader's going to get bored uh you know like the pinch in the middle of of 2a is really just a way of saying you should do something that complicates things somewhere around page 40. Cause if they don't, if you don't, the reader's going to get bored. So that's been incredibly useful for us. Yeah. One, one rule of thumb that I, I heard that I always liked is that like something should happen every 15 pages, like, yeah. rough, you know, yeah. just like something should happen every page, but like something big should happen roughly every 15 pages. One yeah. thing that I guess we could, uh, tell people about that's uh, that I think was really useful for us is that when we got into we started working a lot with the Russo brothers right and and their breakdown of a script was always a first act there was a 2a and there was a 2b and then there was a third act and the 2a was always bisected by something they called a pinch Mm -hmm. And 2B was always bisected by something they called a pinch. So it was kind of like 2A has a midpoint, 2B has a midpoint, and then there's a third act, right? So so it was just like a really clear way, especially when you're making movies like The Avengers, that like, like you said, every 15 minutes, something meaningful is happening. Yeah. Something that, that turns the story is constantly happening at about those intervals, right? In that sphere of Batman, like how much freedom, where were you given freedom in the script and where were you restricted when you're actually writing the scenes? Um, I, I would say we, we were probably given quite a bit of freedom. Yeah. As long as we um, knew where the because like andrew said the the outlines were getting approved so mm -hmm. that's right. like pure plot and then uh and so we know he's starting here we're kind of jumping here it's the relationship with his, with his daughter that's kind of uh, moving things along and and where it's all going to wind up so so that's like the the general gist of, of like sort of the plot outline that everybody's going to agree on. 
within the scenes, uh, we're able to kind of have as much fun as we want to have and, and, and it'll get like pulled back. And then on that particular one, Paul would then come in and probably write 90% of the jokes afterwards mm -hmm. and the humor and, and, you know, so it, it was like kind of constantly evolving. When did you leave the pro exit the project and did, did other people come in to replace you or finish it off? In yeah, way? we got rewritten on the second movie. So it was, uh, yeah, we, it, it came full circle for us. We, we, we did the first pass, we broke the story and then we did the first draft. And I think I'm still like, you know, I'm still proud of this for this. We took a big, a big swing on that draft. Like we, we went really wild and we knew we were taking a risk. And, and, and when, when they saw the work that we did, they were like, uh, this is great guys, but time to bring in some new voices because that's just how they roll. How does it feel? I mean, are you like, oh, okay, I did a job. We're all professionals. Or are you like, oh, God. I think for us, it was, it, it was a little bit of both. We, we definitely were like, we're all professionals. We know this is kind of how the process is, right? Like we expected it. It was, it was going to happen one way or the, but it doesn't like, you know, soothe the burn and any any more you know you're you're like you kind of think that that's your project at that point you've been on it for x amount of months or whatever a year uh and so yeah it's like it's a little bit of both i think we we got we've gotten good at at just kind of moving moving forward on those things especially when you're dealing with big studio stuff like big studio stuff is always gonna um seek out different voices after that experience did were you like did you want more big studio projects because i know like some writers directors creators have gone through the sort of big studio machine and been like that is gonna chew me up that's not for me did you guys were you, were you like sign me up for another one or like no i think we've always liked doing both because like the, the one the one nice thing about working for a big studio movie especially like marvel is that you're working for you're 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 making something that's 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 pre greenlit. Mm. Um, it's it's a very very rare privilege to say this movie's coming out whether we like it or not. So we have to get moving on it and we have to write something. So I mean, at you know the the evidence was that we went straight from Marvel to Transformers, um, and we spent you know the next six years of our lives writing a Transformers animated movie. Um, but in the interim, we've written yeah. several like smaller scripts. Yeah, that are weird as hell, mm -hmm. and um, you let your freak flag fly, you know. Yeah, That's in our various phases of like kind of getting getting going in in a more indie way, and yeah. you, you start to learn like kind of the pros and cons of both. Because when you when you write like a smaller film uh, nowadays in Hollywood, it's kind of like everything that's not IP based is kind of going to be considered a, a smaller yeah. film right so so that's kind of getting its uh funding from quote unquote like indie sources and in the process of that money comes in money falls out you know you you get used to the idea that like it could take years yeah if mm -hmm. if you're lucky that this thing gets gets made it's just sort of like that and I think that's what we've we've learned over over a while, or or not even learned. I think that we just really like writing screenplays. Yeah, I think the two of us like have a lot of fun together, just like breaking story and knowing that we're going to get paid to do this, so we get to go into our office and 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 mess around and and just like throw weird ideas it feels like a privilege so it's kind of like even if it doesn't get made it's a super cool job all right so last thing uh, any words of wisdom or advice you want to leave the audience with before uh before we go um, I, I would say um from just from from a purely career standpoint not an artistic standpoint necessarily really work on your ability to be disappointed um, because I think that, you know, we're all sort of building toward the, 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 
the goal of getting a movie made, but there are so many disappointments along the way um, that I think that like the, the artistic temperament, uh, especially the writerly temperament of like, I know my story best, I know my characters best. Um, we've seen a lot of really talented writers um, either, you know, find like move into other other businesses or or just not make it because they don't have the stomach for disappointment mm -hmm. and the humility i guess to to just say like well you know i'm i'm happy to be here um which you have to you know sometimes you have to watch your thing get torn to shreds and just be like i'm happy to be here and it's like you're you're making movies and that's the goal so i would say um especially if, if you're if you're if you're young in the business um steal yourself